uh, and give comfort uh, to those people um, you are uh, applying for funding to or, or um, pitching for work. Accounts have basically historically two uh, components. One is the profit and loss and one is the balance sheet. And sometimes people with numbers, and apologies for those of you who have more experience than others, it, it, it can be a difficult concept for people to get a hold of So, um, as to what the difference is. Uh, and I had a student of mine explain it to me quite well that in a way that I hadn't really thought of. So your profit and loss is your financial performance. So what revenue do you generate over a period of time? What costs do you incur over a period of time? And are you profitable? Um, that can be seen like a movie. So that's a year in the life of your business or a month in the life of your business. And what happens over that period of time? The other one then is the balance sheet, um, also known as the statement of financial position. And that's a snapshot. So that's your photograph on a specific date that says at that date, what do I own? What do people owe me? What do I owe other people? And therefore, whilst the cash balance is always on that balance sheet, it's at a very specific date. And that can be really open to fluctuations. So on the 31st of January, if you've paid all your wages on the 30th and nobody, none of your um, customers or clients pay you until the 1st of February, it might be a low point. It might be a high point if everybody pays you the day, the day before. So understanding um, that it is just a single snapshot in time is really important. So that's looking backwards um, and understanding what has gone is important and being able to explain operationally what that means. So if you've got fluctuations in turnover or profit, why was that? Can you explain it to people in a way that they understand that makes sense commercially, that still gives them confidence that you know what you're talking about? Looking forward, I always joke that projections are wrong almost the minute you hit save on them because things will always be different. They're all, they can only ever be a best guess and you want it to be as best and an educated and a supported guess as possible so that you can give people confidence in your ability to guess. <laughs> Commonly, the, the way that um, if we're doing appraisals for, for funders, it's give us your projections for last year and then give us what you actually did. And that'll tell us how good you are at predicting the future. And if you're very good, I'll ask for Saturday's lottery numbers. Um, they will always be wrong, but it's broadly speaking, are you delivering what you say you will deliver? And if you're not, can you explain that? Um, and what does it mean? So they are only a, a things that you expect to happen. And when you're applying for funding, um, of any type, really. They commonly cover three to five years, but ultimately it's going to be the first year that's most important. It'll be the first year that people will expect you to understand in more detail. Um, you might, you know, you can talk about what, what supports it. So how much visibility do I have over the first year? Because that gives me confidence that at the end of the first year, I'll have visibility for the second year and, and so on. The main difference with looking forwards compared with looking backwards is that not only do we have a profit and loss and a balance sheet but we also have a cash flow and the fundamental thing that everybody looking for um, at a set of projections will want to know and have confidence in that they are integrated so there is a clear trackable um uh line of, of both rationale and calculation from the profit and loss through the cash flow into the balance sheet. And it's brilliant how accountancy works. Um, it's you can't have and I always get I, I get really nervous if people send me one or two or even three. If, if, you're, if I don't get all three of these, I start to worry about what I'm missing because you can hide stuff if you don't have all three of them. If you've got a profit and loss, you know where you are. You can calculate the cash flow. If you've just got a profit and loss and a cash flow, what are you hiding that isn't in the balance sheet? You know, you, you could be in your cash flow. You could be not paying anybody that you owe money to. It'll all come out in your balance sheet. We'll, we'll all know where it is. So you, you can't... Um, 
you can't hide anything if you've got all three uh, and they are and they are integrated. And that's exactly how it works, is that you have your movements in the year from your profit and loss. You have your balance sheet at the end of the year that says, what do people owe me? What do I owe other people? And the movement between the two is your cash flow. Um, the flip side of it is, if you have a profit and loss and a cash flow, the balance sheet is what is left. And those of us who are accountants can put the balance sheet together and work out whether you're hiding anything um, or what the problem is. So um, never think you can dupe an accountant like that. It's about the one way we're about as good as Miss Marple. Um, it really um, demonstrates to somebody how your business generates cash from, from profit. There have been plenty of businesses who are profitable according to their accounts. But the reason why businesses fail is not because they're not profitable, it's because they can't generate cash. I've got clients who are loss making according to the accounts, but generate cash because they're particularly good at turning any form of um, pure profit uh, into cash. So you can have a loss making business that isn't in danger of, um, of going bust because the, the profit and loss contains non-cash items, but you can have a profitable business that um, goes bust because it doesn't have cash. Fundamentally, the point of the projections is to show when the funding is needed, how much, and what are you going to use it for? So what is the thing that causes that funding need? Um, and, uh, how much do you how much do you need to bridge the how much do you need to bridge the gap and this is fundamentally if you're going for for funding what what they're used for um and it's always the bit that everybody gets most um concerned about the numbers are always the bit that people leave to last um uh, you know we're not sure where to where to start and people say well i'm not a numbers person i'm an operational person so working with clients, I always say, start from what you know. Every financial plan is underpinned or needs to be evidenced by what actually happens in real life. So if you're operationally minded, um, because fundamentally that's where it is, I want to do something, I want to supply something, I want to service uh, with my expertise, that's what I want to do, I'm the doing person, so map that out and what it looks like. Draw it in a Gantt chart, build it up. Um, what do you need to do what you want to do? Where am I now? Where do I want to be in? And break it down in those stages. Is it four weeks, 12 weeks, six months, a year? And commonly I get people to start in those, in those stages, particularly in the early stages of a business where things change very quickly. Um, it can be very daunting to think, well, where do I want to be in a year? Don't set it in detail. Let's just, let's build up. It becomes, you know, the, the greatest, longest journey to begin with a single step. So build up from what you know. And you don't have to necessarily put numbers to it to start with. But really think about the detail. What do I need? Do I need premises? If I need people, what type of people do I need? And when am I going to need them? If I'm going to, you know, sell this amount, what materials am I going to need? When am I going to have to buy them? How do I get the route to market for what am I doing? Am I using agents? Am I, do I need to get into retail? Start building up what that looks like. And that will start to set you on that path of working out a plan where you can start to put numbers to it. Then start to think about some of the financial, what I might call admin, um, the actual process of turning those sales, those customers into cash, because fundamentally that's what we have to do. So if you're doing what you're doing and you map this out, 
when do you bill your clients or or your customers? How long will they take to pay? How long will you let them have to pay? Will you make them pay in advance? Will you give them 30 days credit, 60 days credit, whatever it is? If you're selling a thing, do you, when do you have to buy materials? How do you get it manufactured? Do you manufacture it your, yourself? Um, if you're delivering services, how many people do you need? When do they need to come on board to be potentially trained? Um, again, it's that thinking in detail about how you're going to achieve what you're going to achieve. And we're just putting the processes around it. When are you going to pay suppliers? What are you going to pay your people? Do you need to buy equipment? All of these things just start building up operationally. There are some sort of slightly, I suppose, more technical accounting areas that go around the outside. VAT, PAYE, National Insurance, Corporation Tax. There are some basic calculators around um, you know, you will have VAT returns, often zero will do your VAT returns for, you know, you can click buttons and it works it out for you, same with payroll. So you start to understand how those things work and you have to build those things into the model. Fundamentally, these are some of the differences between your profit and loss and, and your cash flow. So they do get more technical and this might be where you start to, to seek help, but you'll be seeking help from a point of more knowledge and strength in, in, in what you are doing. There are many ways that you can um, build models. Um, and really, I think fundamentally, it comes down to, to these two main, uh, main ways. So Excel, everybody's got it. But lots of people are, again, a bit like numbers, are very daunted by it. Um, so lots of formulas, they can be really great, but actually can be difficult. To, to start with, um, or we've got software, similar to how there's Zero and QuickBooks and everything else, we've got uh, those of us um, <laughs> with uh, Andrew Beer on the call, those of us who remember the old wind forecast, uh, there's there's wind forecast, which was one of our favourite, you know, loads and loads of people used it, and then Sage um, discontinued it. Uh, we now have things like Castaway and Forecast 5, and there's a, um, uh, there's a tool within Zero that can do it. So lots of these, um, the software can, can help and it can do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. They have their pros and their cons. And really it's about understanding um, your audience ultimately and what you want to achieve. Uh, the speed. Um, so I have uh, some clients, for example, who will um, come to us and say, I don't really know whether I need any funding or not. I've got this thing I want to do. Um, can we run some scenarios quickly so I can understand whether I need funding? And software is brilliant for that. All the integration is done. Um, you know, the presentation can be much easier. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about the numbers. It does the VAT for you. It, it can do your corporation tax for you. You know, there are basic assumptions all built in ready for you. Uh, it can do a lot of the heavy lifting from a technical perspective. But it's limited to who has the software. And people have to trust that that software works. And the integration, which is hidden, is fundamentally um, there and has the integrity that, that they want. And if you can't dig into either the software or you don't have the software to be able to read the, the file itself, that doesn't always lend to, to the easiest process for, for people. Excel, on the other hand, takes a long time to, to prepare to get the integration correctly. Uh, you have to, you know, the use of formulas can be amazing, but you've got to understand how they work. Um, and you need to be able to model the different things that you, you need to, to model. But anybody can read them. So you can send them to people and it's, it's all out there. So you have to be certain that it works correctly. Um, another good reason to have your balance sheet, because if your balance sheet balances, you, you're not missing anything, which is always always good. There's a telltale sign if you're an accountant. Um, a balance sheet not balancing just means you don't believe anything in, in front of you. Um, and therefore, 
well, that can be preferential, particularly if you're going for larger amounts um, or you might be going for equity funding. Uh, you know, those types of things really need an Excel or you're skilled enough that you can take it in-house afterwards uh, so that you're not reliant on, uh, on your accountant if you're doing it externally um, and you keep it up to date. So those are the two main ways of, um, uh, of preparing forecasts. And sometimes people will go between the two. You know, I've done my software. I know I've got a funding need. Actually, I need to now delve into it in a bit more detail and somebody needs to want, be able to read it without the software. Um, so having done all my assumptions work, it's really just the integration and I'll, I'll progress to an Excel. So again, it, horses for courses um, in many ways. Uh, and some of it depends on um, whether you have an advisor or not in, in many cases. Projections and funding applications can take time. Um, and often, well, <laughs> often, you know, you are the person who's doing everything. Um, for those of us a certain age, if you remember the uh, Dennis Waterman joke about writing the theme tune, singing the theme tune and, and acting in the programme, um, when you're doing everything and forecasts and numbers aren't your strong point, having support in that area is, is a good thing to do. As long as you also use it to develop your own, uh, your own knowledge. An advisor can act as a really good sounding board to say, well, I've assumed this. Does that sound, um, you know, like it's reasonable? It might be the case that, you know, they can have experience in lots of funding applications, uh, lots of different funders, and also lots of different businesses in, in the same or similar sectors, or indeed can help you learn from, from other sectors. So they can have a, a powerful role to play in getting you knowing your numbers faster and in more detail uh, and can also help you articulate them and help you uh, voice some of those operational things in a, in a more technical manner. However, I would always say that you cannot use them to replace your own, uh, your own knowledge. So your experience of the business um, ultimately you will be delivering whatever you raise the funding for uh, and therefore if you have an advisor do all the heavy lifting and you don't really understand it how is anybody going to have the confidence that you are able to deliver that that plan because it isn't your plan um, and therefore make sure you use advisors carefully uh, and knowingly um, to make sure that you get both the best for you um, and the best out of, of them in terms of what you need. Um, so when you're presenting um, your, uh, your numbers, um, there are key things for you to know and, and learn about and there's a difference between pitching and presenting and it being in a business plan. Uh, lots of people, I know Dragon's Den isn't, um, you know, a, the, the most realistic uh, representation. It's certainly getting more good for telly than, than lots of other things. But it is very interesting when you watch the types of questions that they edit in that people fumble over. Um, uh, what do they get asked? fundamentally it is they are the, the questions that that people will will ask you they just might not ask them when you're standing in a um second floor of a of an empty warehouse so watch those uh, and start with those your advisor will know those so if if i'm pitching to you what what is it that i'm going to ask you um what is it that i want to know more and use, if you are using an advisor, that process of how they question you on uh, making sure that they are able to understand your business are the types of things that anybody else would question you on. It's about understanding the headlines uh, in a pitching situation and having those headlines uh, at your fingertips um, and knowing, knowing the terminology in some ways that the simplest uh, questions um, are, are the things that, that trip people up. So get those headline figures uh, in your head, understand 
um, what it is that people are interested in. And if you're pitching for funding, how have you funded it to date? What have you generate, used that funding for? What have you been able to generate in, in revenue and gross profit? Your net assets are an indication of how much you've retained in the business um, and how profitable you've been. So that, that can be a key figure for, um, for some. And then understand going forward, operationally, how that fits with the numbers. So um, how, much, how much is my revenue? What's my turnover? But how is that turnover derived? Is it based on units? Is it based on hours? Um, who are my customers and who am I selling to? Who are my suppliers and how do I make those, uh, those sales um, is how you get to, to your gross profit. Um, what are the other costs around it? And therefore, what am I left with at the end, which is my net profit? And then what am I going to do with uh, that money? And where does it get me? Um, you know, I, I've, I've made £100,000 of sales to date. Um, my target is to get half, to half a million. Um, in order to do this, uh, I need to um, undertake a promotion with a, a key customer that I've managed to get an opportunity with. Um, to do that, I need £75,000 worth of funding to buy my stock in advance so I can make uh, my product and put it into that customer. Um, you know, clearly articulating what it is that you're trying to achieve with, with that money. And then depending on where, um, what type of funding you're, uh, you're applying for, or you're pitching for, it then comes into what do you bring? What do they bring? What's their risk? Um, and what are you offering in return uh, in terms of whether that's interest or equity in the business? Um, all of those sorts of things are the, the types of things you then start to cover. So we've done a very whistle-stop tour um, because really I wanted to make sure that there's plenty of time for um, discussion and questions. So if people want to, and, and you don't have to switch on cameras or and or mics um, and either share personal experiences, um, ask questions about where you are at, at the minute and the types of fundings that, funding that you're looking for, and we can talk about types of funding. Um, what do people want to share or ask? Catherine, it's Andrew B. here. Um, just, just one, hi there, how are you doing? Yeah, it's just a little more detail, really. You mentioned wind forecast and Sage is, seems to be prohibitive, really, in, in giving you any sort of decent forecasting tool. I just wondered what the forecasting tools you mentioned three there, you know, what, what would be the pros and cons and perhaps how they how they might integrate with the, the accounts packages? Yeah. So um, the, uh, the software that we use is called Castaway. Um, it's an online cloud-based platform, similar to Xero. Um, it, uh, you, you can integrate it with Sage and Xero and a number of things. Um, uh, it gets quite technical on the, on the mapping um, of your uh, nominal codes, but once you've set it up, it can be an automatic feed. And the integration is built in. Uh, and the good thing for um, those of us who, who used to use the old Sage product is that when Sage decided they would switch off wind forecast and they made their developers redundant, um, they went off and set up their own things. So Castaway actually operates very similarly to uh, Sage wind forecast. Um, I find it quite uh, intuitive. Um, it steps things through quite uh, operationally in the way that I'm talking. So if you're building up sales, it's how do I sell? Do I sell in units? Um, how long do people take to, to pay me? Um, it, when I'm making something, it's uh, how far in advance do I have to buy the materials? What material percentage cost do I have? Or do I buy in units based on what I'm selling? So you can, that process of operationally working out where I am, can step through quite nicely into, into how those, that software works. 
Um, Forecast 5 is another one that's an online package, um, again, developed by people who left Sage, not quite as, as flexible, in my opinion. Um, and when we talk about the differences between uh, software and Excel, the most common thing that comes up is the flexibility that um, it is hard for there to be um, flexibility in the integration because it's all hidden behind in, in the software. Uh, they are more flexible than when forecast used to be. So you can change assumptions as many times as you, as you want in the model. There are a myriad of different ways of, of setting up the projections financially. But fundamentally, you don't have the, the transparency and the, and the flexibility that, that Excel provides. The flip side of that is, is people trust it because you can't fiddle with the integration uh, and you can't, um, uh, you can't change uh, too much about it. So anybody who reads it knows that you are bound by um, the parameters of, of the software. So, uh, you know, it, it, it is horses for courses. Um, I must admit, we probably use software more than we do Excel, um, purely because lots of the work that we do with clients is, is ongoing. And therefore, if you can set up the mapping nicely from the accounting package into the software, updates become easy and it becomes much more about how have we performed against plan? Let's talk about variance analyses. Um, let's look at what those trends are and, and look going forwards. And like I said at the beginning of the presentation, the, the historics are only good to a, to a point, having them most up to date and being able to look at that particularly near future is, is what you need. Does that answer your question, Andrew? Are you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Catherine. Is anyone else with any questions at all for Catherine? <clears throat> Hi, yeah, it's, it's Richard here from Do Goodly. I, I'm sort of fairly well new business, and um, we've got ourselves. So I'm in Accardo, I'm in Morrison's, and a number of wholesalers. And uh, when we launched the business, um, and so it's a consumer product, it's a range of dips basically, and. Uh, so we had sort of fairly good sort of front margins that we'd managed to get the retail. But obviously with all the sort of inflationary pressures, um, our sort of front margins have been squeezed. So with the wholesalers, it's fairly easy to put through sort of cost increases with um, the, the sort of retail partners, because of where we're at at the moment, we're probably not in a position where I can reflect them because of at the same time I've got the sort of cost pressures. Actually, mm. there's a lot of, there's a lot of deflation in the market in that category. So it's sort of like a perfect storm, basically. So so the, the, the question, so it's, it, this is more context and I will come on to the question. So is so the bit for me is, so I, I'm, I'm in that sort of position at the moment, really to get the sort of level of margin I would need. And then also for, because this question is more loaded towards um, me think about sort of getting investors in the future and people obviously interested in investing in the business is obviously you have to show the right sort of margins um, through the P&L, which historically would have been able to show that obviously currently it's not. And I'm in a position where really the only way to sort of get the margin is obviously either you, you pass that on and give higher prices to retail if they can take it or you, you improve your own cost of goods. And on both of those is a challenge unless I get more scale, which would probably come through investment basically. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I'm just trying to get, I was just to get your thoughts, obviously, as you're dealing with a lot of these sort of things is that in that scenario that I'm in, um, if I was to present a sort of a, a vision of almost like where we could get to with scale, with investment to unlock a better margin, is that something that, from your experience that people would sort of buy into as long as it's credible so that was quite a long-winded question but yeah. Yeah, the context basically yeah no it's good it's good yeah and and it is 
Uh, it, it is really difficult at the minute, and I, and I feel for you in that sense. It's like you've, you've got the worst of both of the um, of the sets of inflationary pressures almost, um, because the the inflationary pressures in some areas are causing cost pressure from from the the supermarkets and retailers in others to try and manage it, aren't they? Um, it's like you say, it's a it's a perfect storm. Um, the brief answer to the question is yes, because ultimately, getting to that scale and improving your profitability is how you will generate more value both for you and the investor. Um, so uh, getting, <laughs> building that model that says, well, what scale do I need to be in order to be able to do these things, either, like you say, reduce your cost of sales or, or increase price or indeed both if you could. Um, the challenge will be then, how do you evidence that in the forecast to say that that's what's possible? So do you have, um, yeah, do you know the volumes at which you'd be able to do that to be able to prove it? Um, and if it's one side, how do you justify the other? So if it's, if I buy this much, then I can get it at a lower price, which increases my margin. The flip side of that question is, how do you sell more? And is the demand there in order to do it? And do you have that the ready market to be able to say, well, we might not be able to increase prices, but actually those supermarkets or those retailers will take a greater volume? Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I think, when I, yeah, yeah. Because I think when I was sort of planning for that, I was going to go based off, start with sales first. So where can you sell it? And then that would obviously... Um, so, for example, we're in Morrison, we're only in 60 of their stores. They've got 400 stores. So, you know, if I could get, you know, obviously it's not an easy thing to do, but if I could get in 40 stores. So it's just, so I was going to base it on, right, if we can get the revenue, what would that drive in terms of efficiencies and sort of economies of scale to then get the costs down, basically. And then I think, again, if you've got the scale, if I work with them, I might be able to pass on a cost increase. So that was my sort of thinking, but I just want to sense yeah, check. It's, it, it's like I said, it's building that up, operationally up so you know which side you're you're going for. So so that example is, is great of the, okay, well, if they've taken it in 40 and they're doing well, then how many more would they, would they take it in? And then the question becomes... Um, can I produce it in the time scales needed? So do I have the supply base there? And then with the supply base, this is, you know, you're much more likely to have the, well, if I do this amount of volume, this is the unit price that I that I get. So in some ways it's easier to justify it that way around um, as long as you, you've got some indication of, of the interest, uh, the other side. Um, the, the challenge then when it comes to profit and therefore as an investor, what return am I getting on my investment? Um, the increased profitability is, is great because that increases the value of the company or enables you to repay debt, whichever, whichever route you go. Um, but then it's about, are there other things to make sure that that profitability is underpinned? So are, do you have enough overheads to run something that scales at that size? So the, the, the note of making sure you think through all of those things is that when people start to jump turnover and say, well, we can do it on the existing cost base, in reality, that's quite rare um, because you still can't be everything and do everything uh, when you start to scale. So in, in making something uh, presentable and robust to somebody, it's evidencing that you've thought about do I need another senior member of staff? Do I need to start to need my own financial director or um, financial controller, depending on which stage you're at? Do I need marketing in order to do that? Um, I mean, I always remember I, I had a, uh, a customer who produced yogurt who was in, um, they, were, they were just getting into Asda and it was, they got to a certain size and they wanted to sell more, but the cost pressure almost became more then because it was, well, we'll take more, but you're going to have to do a promotion at the end of an aisle for us to prove that you can sell more with us before yeah. we take more. So you almost get a margin hit before you get a margin boost. Mm -hmm. um, so 
you know, and you may not know those things, but pricing those things into a model can really prove to somebody that I've thought about it. And actually, this is a prudent model. So when I'm saying I need this amount of money to do this, and this is how much return or um, how much profit I'll make afterwards, actually, I've thought about things and, and there's a good chance that it'll be better than this because I've priced something in that might not happen but I know how the market works and therefore I've, I've thought about that challenge. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that, no, it's it, no, it's good. Good build. No, thank you. Um, no, thank you. Yeah. No problem. Hi, Catherine. Can I ask you a question, please? Yes, of course. Um, Oh, by the way, good to see you again. I, you were on the town square accelerator. You did a yes. session for that. Yep. So nice to see you again. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm right at the beginning. Um, I'm just on my own company, one uh, sole trader at the moment. And I've, my company's kind of like in two halves, I guess, because I've got my normal kind of freelance work, which is, which is profitable and, and there's no overhead. So I work, work from home and, you know, it's, a, it's an audio business. And then I guess what this is all building up to is, you know, I've invented this, this product uh, and may want to go and get, get funding to try and kind of, you know, take it, take it big. Um, but you know, one, so one side is a kind of tiny little business. That's me that's profitable. And then the other side is absolute guesswork. I haven't got a customer yet. All I've got is a shiny new product. That's completely new. We can't even price it. I don't know what anyone's willing to pay for it. You know, I, I struggle to know how I structure my accounts, you know, because do I split them off or do I join them all together? Or, you know, I, I don't really even know how to approach it. <laughs> so I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. <laughs> Um, wow, the, the, there's probably quite a lot to unpack that we haven't got enough time to, to cover, but I'll, I'll cover some, some key things. I mean, it, it's whether you, I suppose, whether you have them together or, or separate is in, in some ways um, personal choice. There's more admin if you separate them out. But um, from a, uh, a, a risk perspective, and an activity perspective, it's probably better to keep them distinct. Yeah. Um, and that makes it, I suppose, more easily presentable to somebody in a coherent way. I, I have this entity that's that's doing this, and you're the bit that's you that's profitable, that's effectively enabling you to, to fund what you're doing over here, um, is... I suppose it's by the by. I mean, that's just how you're funding what you want to do. Um, there will be, I suppose, there, there is a point in time at which the bit that makes money that pays for you to do the other thing becomes too much of a distraction and you're going to have to make a decision um, one way or another. Uh, and how fast you do that might depend on your window of opportunity, uh, whether you've got, you know, a, a time limited, I suppose, market opportunity um, uh, compared with um, where it's not really limited either because you're so novel and you're under the radar at the minute or because actually it's a different way of doing something that's that's out there already. Um, in terms of how you start pricing it or anything else, that's, uh, I suppose, without knowing exactly what it is it's a very difficult thing to do there there are two i suppose financially there are two ways of um pricing things and the most common way to start is how do i make it and therefore what margin do i need to make and what therefore how much do i need to add on top of that to make money from it and that's called the cost plus model uh because if you know what something costs to make, um, then you're you're starting from the point of at least I'm not making a loss. I'm always going up from from there, and I've got a minimum uh, amount. But you have to make sure you price in everything into that, um, you know, in in order to be able to uh, make sure you cover stuff. So things that might be missed in that type of thing are um, uh, overhead. So if you're working out about making it yourself, making sure that you price in absolutely everything you need, 
which includes all the support staff and, and everything as well, because the margin has to be able to cover everything you need on, on top of that. Um, and that's where I come back to, OK, so what might you need people wise, salesperson, uh, all of that sort of stuff. Um, I'm trying to think through all the, <laughs> the various other bits that we're trying to unpack. No, that's really useful. I think I think there is a good case for separating it off because and what also what I found very useful from your presentation was that idea of really forcing yourself to go into the detail of thinking, well, what what could I need? And at least if you can demonstrate that you've thought about that, then even if the numbers are, well, like they are guesswork to an extent, at least you know what you're guessing at. Yes. And if you've got, I always say that if you've, if you've got a rationale for each of the numbers, the overall thing becomes inherently reasonable and supported. And, and it's that, you know, the longest journey starts with the, the smallest step. If I can say, well, within that, this is how I've built that up, then, you know, the, the fact that somebody may say, well, the, you know, how, how can you be doing that? Well, actually, I've got all of these things that support what I've said. So if you can't argue with all the building blocks that go into it, then it's very hard for somebody to argue with the, the final number that, that comes out. And I think some people miss that. And you're not going to be able to pin everything down to the nth degree and, and everything else, but it becomes a game of probability where the more evidence and the, the more thought that has gone to, into each individual number, the more reasonable the whole the overall becomes. Thanks. That's really useful. Hi, Catherine. Lovely to meet you. John Tolfi here. Uh, Hi, John. Tech Engineering. Hello there. Uh, it's just a quick question, really, because I've got to go and see a customer in five minutes. But I'm just wondering, what's the best practice for forecasting in a more project-based business? We've got an engineering company, basically, and we've got quite a number of projects that we deal across and some different sectors. And it's just getting that best practice for the forecasting. Um, oh, there are, in terms of the financial forecasting now, I guess thinking about how... Um, I might uh, I might approach it. There are a number of different there are a couple of different ways of of doing it. Um, there is you could build up on a project by project basis, um, and then have a central model that is always loss making, because it's just all the other costs, um, and then consolidate those to understand whether the overall makes sense. Mm. Um, or you go down the traditional route, I say the traditional route, of absorption costing. Now, I don't, I don't necessarily go in for the very traditional, each unit of something that you produce has to have an amount of overhead priced into it. But there are ways of allocating overheads to different projects. Um, and therefore, you can have a project by project. Does this make sense to the overall um and does it make uh, a contribution and a sufficient contribution to cover all the costs that um that it incurs i, I tend to um uh, towards the first one of those where it's will the direct costs of this so will the Will, will the, I suppose it, it's pure contribution then, isn't it? Will the revenue less the direct costs of this project give us a sufficient contribution to the overall overheads um, for it to be for it to be worthwhile? Um, and it can be a really hard thing to do because whichever way you do it, there are imperfections in how those um, costs might be allocated. So are you missing something in dividing all the costs up amongst different projects um or are you not understanding and thinking that something is uh more profitable by considering it on a contribution only basis and not uh, not on a net profit basis um that's why i think particularly software solutions for that can be quite helpful where there are there are one button consolidation options because it's let's price out the project and then let's wrap it into a, a scenario in a, in a one button 
Um, and whilst it's never going to be perfect uh, and it's not always going to be fully transparent for the ongoing, we need to make these decisions quite quickly and we need to have a tool that will enable us to do that. Um, that can work really well. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Are there any other? We've got a couple more. We've got a couple more minutes. Hi, Catherine. I've had one come through to me um, personally on the um, on the chat. Oh, right. Yes. Um, if you have to pitch for funding and part of your proposition is in collaboration with another organisation, but not a formal JV approach, what's the best approach? I'm hoping I've said that properly now. <laughs> <laughs> um I think it depends on um the nature of the working together and how reliant it is on on the two on the two entities um I mean it'd be interesting to understand the the context as to whether it it's a it's effectively a joint bid for something um or a, a, a joint application that both are equally responsible for delivering, um, or whether it's a, I need, I need this partner as, as part of it. I think it comes, if, if there is quite a lot of reliance on, on both parties, it is good to have both parties involved in, um, in the pitch, if it's an in-person pitch. Uh, I think in a plan or in a written application, it needs to be carefully balanced um, as to, uh, I suppose, ensuring that lines of responsibility and delivery are clear. And I think that's that's going to be fundamentally what it comes down to is who's going to be fundamentally responsible for this and do they have the ability to deliver the whole thing, even though one part of that will effectively be project managing a third party. Uh, so it it's uh, I'm, I'm, you know I suppose we we pitch for for things um, with project partners, and I will admit that more often than not we do it together, where you each cover your your area of expertise, but one party always has to take the lead and demonstrate the ability to overall project manage and deliver the the whole thing, because otherwise it can come across as confused. And, and either nobody's responsible or it's, um, uh, you know, you end up with which one, which bit's the lead part. So it might be helpful to understand a bit more of the, of the context, but hopefully that's helpful in the first instance. Okay, I'm guessing um, they, I wasn't here at the beginning, sorry, I've taken over from Sue and here, but um, if anyone has further queries, are they okay to contact you? Yes, yeah, that's fine. Your email, um, yeah. Yeah. I, they've made you work for your money this morning with the questions. <laughs> I'm doing, I've been on one where there's been so many. I'll just double check. I know that people are having to shoot off now. Has anyone else got anything quickly? Any comments or anything for Catherine this morning? It's obviously a hot topic for the, uh, for the amount of questions that you've had this morning. So uh, no, great answers. Thanks. Oh, there we go. The answers to your... Um, to the earlier one now so thank you for the information sorry have to go yeah i think um i think you're done now you can go and grab yourself a well earned cup of coffee there <laughs> um thank some you. of you i think i may see this afternoon um if not thanks for giving up your time this morning thanks catherine it's been um full of information for everyone and a lot to go away with um slides and things are you happy sharing Yes, yeah, that's fine. I'll um I'll send over a a, a PDF and with my contact details, and then uh, they can be uh they can be sent. They'll be held to ransom until they sign their AG three. Yes, so they good idea. Until, they're not having them until I've had their AG three signed back. But um, thanks everyone, that's great. For anyone I see later on this afternoon, if not, I'll see you on that one of our next webinars soon. So thanks for joining us. All right, all right. Nice to see you all. Bye. Bye.